and looking at the Philippian jailer and his conversion, Paul and Silas have been thrown into prison. And that event starts about verse 22. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows on them, they threw them into prison, having the jailer to keep them safely. Uh, threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all of the doors were opened. And everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his household. And they took him the same hour of the night and washed his wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and his family. And, they, and he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire family or his entire household that he had believed in God. <clears throat> I think it was the first, if it, if it wasn't the first, it was the second sermon that I preached from the back of my truck out back about this event and discussing how the most dangerous thing that was allowed to happen was that Paul and Silas were kept together and how important that was and how they were able to help one another because they were with one another. It's a terrific message, but that's not what we'll look at specifically this morning. We are finishing the month of Made Disciples. So we're going to look more at the reaction of the Philippian jailer, the jailer who is mentioned here. While Paul and Silas are together, they are shining their light. There are so many other additional things that are included in the scripture. The beaten offer healing to those who deliver stripes. That's backwards, but it happens. The beaten offer healing to those who deliver stripes. Those who are without light are the only ones who have the ability to offer clear vision. <coughs> and those who are imprisoned are the only ones free. Those who are free are actually imprisoned. This story is so backwards because we read it with an earthly mindset and all of these things seem normal. Normal events. The jailer is the one who is free, except he's bound in his sin. Paul and Silas are the ones who are bleeding, and they're the only ones who offer the healing that God can, that only God can give. And while the jailer doesn't know what's going on and he's calling for light, the ones who are truly shining their light are those who are sitting in the dark. What an awesome story. and What an awesome way our God works to make sure that those who need salvation find it. Paul and Silas belong to God. They are doing His work and now they're sitting in jail. And instead of being downtrodden and mournful, instead of... I worked in a jail for a little bit of time. And you can see the remorse of people who sit in the holding cell and it's almost like you can hear what they're thinking. If I hadn't done this or that, if I hadn't turned left, I'd have got away. If I hadn't done this action, I wouldn't be sitting here. And whatever it is, it's always a, a second guessing, seems to be. Paul and Silas don't have anything to second guess. Would you shut up and not proclaimed God? Would you have fought back like Peter tried to do? That's not our job. Would you have not exercised, specifically what is done here, is exercising the power of God to heal a girl of demon possession. You're just going to leave that unchecked? They've got nothing to second guess. So what can they do? They can shine their light. 
They also don't have any idea that there's an earthquake coming. Adam Clark's commentary on these verses, or on one of these verses, though these holy men felt much and had every reason to fear more, yet they were undismayed and even happy in their sufferings, they were so fully satisfied that they were, that they were right and had done their duty that there was no room for regret or self-reproach. At the same time, they had such consolations from God as could render any circumstances not only tolerable but delightful. And although they were in the inner prison, they sang so loudly and heartily that the prisoners heard them. I, I, I skipped right over that in reading this so many times. But the, the jailer takes them and he's given these people, Paul and Silas, and say, you hold them for us. So he puts them in the inner prison. They're not in with gin pop. They are in ISO. And that's where they are way down deep. And yet they're singing so, as Adam Clark puts it, so loudly and heartily that the other prisoners heard them. It wasn't, you know, let's sing this song, but I'm worried I'm going to get off key. Let's sing this song, but not so we don't want to cause a disturbance. The worst place you might could imagine. They are praising God. What an awesome example. But what is this consolation? Because I agree here with Sir Adam Clark that they had such consolations from God, but they don't know that the earthquake is about to happen. There's not an angel that comes down. They have the Roma Downing moment and say, hang on, we're fixing to shake the earth. That's not how this reads whatsoever. So what is the consolation? Jeremy covered this so well and has been for a couple of Wednesday nights in this arena of assurances. In 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 16, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in Him. By this is perfected, by this love is perfected in us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. There is assurance. I get this question um, as far as received questions, this one typically comes up more often. And, and I got it recently, and I really enjoy answering it. And the question always goes something to the effect of, how do you know you can be saved? Or how do you know you are saved? Or does God give any promises for salvation? Do you know you're going to heaven? Well, Scripture gives several answers for, yes, you should know I am absolutely going to heaven. Because why? Because God says this. He says that if I love perfectly, if I'm doing it like He wants me to do, there's this line in here, as He is, so also are we in this world. And the idea there is God is where you are because you are showing Him. Is God everywhere you are because you're always showing Him? Yeah? Then you should have absolutely no fear of condemnation. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We are supposed to have these assurances. So as Paul and Silas are sitting in a jail cell losing in this life, they have no need to fear anything because they've already attained the victory. 1 John chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 say, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are on are not burdensome for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is our victory that has overcome the world our faith in overcoming the world it's because we follow his commandments it's because we're loving as he loves it's because we're showing him in our lives and when you can lay your head on the pillow or on the stone as Paul and Silas may have very well been at night and you lay down to close your eyes you can say I did everything I could today. I'm confident that if these are my last breaths, that I'll wake up in heaven. And our confidence should be assured. It is here for Paul and Silas. Their lives belong to God. They're not afraid of anything. 
Why is keeping His commandments the love of God? How, how do those work together? First of all, it's consistency. If we are faithful to His Word, then He is faithful to His promise. If we are faithful to His Word, then He is faithful to His promise. What has He promised? He's promised heaven to all of those who have been faithful to His Word. It's victory over this life. Paul and Silas knew that they were obedient. They knew they weren't perfect, but they knew that they were obedient. Therefore, they had confidence in their salvation. So much so that they sang loudly and heartily, as Sir Adam Clark puts it. But they're, they're singing loud enough that from this room to that room over, they're being heard. But then there is an earthquake. In verse 26, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all of the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So what do they do? They got nothing to worry about. Is this deliverance? No. This is the weirdest part of the story, right? There's a great earthquake. All of the doors are opened. All of the chains are loosened. And nothing happens. Why are they in chains and behind locked doors? To keep them from leaving. Why? Because the assumption is they would if they could. Otherwise, you'd live out on bond or, or have dealt with it in another way. It was determined that these people needed to be put in one spot and kept in that one spot and here the, anything that would keep them and could keep them is no more. And nobody goes anywhere. We'll come back to that. They are steadfast. Paul and Silas are steadfast in their confidence so that no matter what the circumstances are, they are victors. The one who cannot say that is the jailer. The jailer has been alerted by God to the earthquake by God for the thing that happened, which is an action of God. And he is shaken to his very foundation. He is shaken so deeply that he decides, you know what would be better? My death. What has happened here is an act of God and the best thing I can do now is die. Look at the stark contrast there. Paul and Silas are doing everything God is that they're supposed to do for God, and their reward is to be beaten by the city and thrown into jail. The, the jailer is doing everything he's supposed to do. He's good at his job. They say, hold this guy. Absolutely. Put him in isolation. He's doing his job really well. And here this one thing happens which no one can control. Absolutely nobody can, can make this stop. God shakes the earth. And the jailer goes, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. Which confidence would you rather have? Zur, E.M. Zur, speaks about this. The Lord wouldn't interfere with the just operation of secular government. Doubtless, the other prisoners were being held lawfully, and God would not perform a jail delivery in opposition to the law. Hence, He unfastened all the fetters, but saw to it that no one escaped. It was sure death to a jailer who'd let, to let prisoners escape, especially after receiving such a charge, which is given in verse 24. He thought he would prefer suicide to the shame of being executed for failure in his duties. He would rather die than to face the shame. He would rather die than to not have succeeded. I pointed out earthquakes are so often, well, first of all, they are always actions of God. And second of all, they're often used as metaphors for something that like God's trying to get your attention and He literally does the shake shake them and wake them up kind of thing by shaking the earth. But so often there's a something that follows out of it so that symbolically you, you should look into the symbolism of whatever it was that had happened around it. Uh, in this part of it, Adam Clark talks and says, uh, thus God bore a miraculous testimony in a symbolical way the nature of the religion of which his servants preached 
While it shakes and terrifies the guilty, it proclaims deliverance to the captives and the opening of the prison doors to them that are bound and sets at liberty them that are bruised. What's Adam talking about here? What does the message of Christ teach? If you are, have been baptized into His blood, if you believe on His name, if you are loving, then God has already assured your salvation, as we talked about earlier, right? Because you're doing these things, you know you're going to heaven. But what does that mean for everybody else? And so while the good news of salvation is awesome news for everyone who's been saved, it means condemnation for everyone who has not. And that should scare you so badly that it, as the jailer experiences, shakes you to your core. Makes you question your life. Not taking your life. Not question taking your life, but what it is you're doing with it. The, the jailer is not, does not belong to God. And this scares him to his core. Paul offers the very first, wait a minute. In verse 28, Paul says, do not harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for the lights and rushed in. Trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. He knows and sees when the light gets there. There's something different going on here. Nothing normal is happening. There's an earthquake. The bonds are open. The chains are dropped. Or the doors are open. The chains are dropped. The prisoners should be gone. Except the one who offers assurance are these two guys that were brought in yesterday because they exercised the power of God. That's, that's why they're in jail. And now they're saying, everybody's here. This is weird. You know what? I may die in five minutes at my own hand. Why don't I spend that listening to Paul and Simon? Why are you all still here? It is awesome that God includes that He calls for the light. Whenever He hears the slightest glimmer of hope, He calls for the light. Paul and Silas have been shining their light all night long, except what, what do we see here? They're in the dark. I, I mean, sure, the earthquake could have put out whatever torch was in there. Is a jailer going to waste oil on a torch for people who are locked in the innermost prison? I, whatever. They're sitting in the dark, shining their light. And now, to see clearly, the jailer calls for light. There's a call comes ringing over the restless wave. Send the light. Jesus, in one of his <coughs> most well-known sermons, calls you the light. What if you were in that jail cell? What if you were sitting with or next to Paul and Silas? Are you shining your light? Can you even sing? Because it is really, really near impossible to cry and sing at the same time. And the idea of incarceration would cause as many people to break down and cry. <clears throat> Let your light shine before others so that they may know your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is exactly what happens for the jailer. They are doing the good works of God. Because they're doing the good works of God, they're in prison, but they know that whatever it is that happens to them, if they get taken out and executed tomorrow or, or whatever winds up happening, that it can be whatever it is. But they know that because they're doing the right thing, they have nothing to fear. And this is their light shining. The Philippian jailer calls for the light. And what happens? I've already read the word a later part of the story, he gives glory to God. So he calls for the light to be brought in. And he says, do me a favor, count the prisoners who are in jail. There should be 17. 
Make sure that all 17 are there. He's got a deputy. He, he called somebody to bring him a lot. He didn't say that at all. No. He says, go close all the doors again. Real quick. I mean, make sure all the doors are closed. And lock them back. He didn't say that at all. In fact, anything that actually pertains to his duty... The thing that he has been doing well. The thing for which he was tasked. They called for the jailer. This guy does his job really, really well. And as soon as God shakes his life and he recognizes that something needs to be different, that old life matters not at all to him. He had not seem to care about his job at this point. I'm not saying he, he absolutely doesn't. But that's not what was important to him. What was important to him was what this light revealed. And not the light of the torch. What the light that Paul and Silas were shining revealed. And because of that, he's going to give glory to God. The light reveals the fact. And he asks about salvation. That is so weird. That is so weird. What sense does that make? Except that the power of God had moved him. The light that was being shown by Paul and Silas had brought him to a point where he recognized nothing else mattered except whatever God it is that they are working, that the power they're working, that God, that's the most important, the only thing that matters right now. And so he gives a weird answer. Or rather poses a a weird question. What must I do to be saved? Now I want to point out something that's going to sound just a little bit weird. They do not tell him to be baptized. And baptism doesn't save this man. You're going to have to give me a minute. We're going to get there. You've got to trust me. me. Give me three and a half minutes. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your household. See, it is belief in Jesus. It is the faith that Paul and Silas have that shines that light. The fact that Paul and Silas were baptized didn't save anybody but Paul and Silas. But their belief in God is something other people saw. It's something that mattered to the jailer. It's something that mattered to the other prisoners. It's something that mattered to that little girl who just lost her demon and praised God because of it. What mattered was their faith, their belief, and what they instill in the jailer is not, we need you to go through a religious ritual, and and he will later. What they need to bring him to is believing in God. So I'll put out to you that there's actually several scriptures that bring you to this place. We like to go to Mark 16, 16. Believe and is baptized, shall be saved. Who does not will be condemned. Where it all hinges is the belief. Because if you get in this water without believing that God is going to save your soul, then you're just taking a bath. If you don't believe in God, you've lost all the power in that salvation. It's not the water. It's the acceptance in your heart in saying, I will do whatever it is that God has for me to do. I will obey His commandments as it said in 1 John. It's that. And that going through the motion. Did Isaac have to die whenever Abraham told, go offer your son on the mountain? No. But when the knife got raised and God saw that Adam, is, or Abraham rather, is willing to do this, that was all that needed to happen. What was pivotal in this story and what, is, what God is praised for at the end of this story is that the jailer came to believe in God. You can't just preach that they have to be baptized to be saved. In fact, you see Scriptures alone without it. John 3.16 If we're not teaching people to believe in God, we're missing half of the mark or more. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house and at the same hour of the night washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Why? Because if you believe that God has the plan for your life, you're going to be baptized. 
baptized. Baptism is the result of your belief. Because I can, I can just get up here and get wet. And that does me no good. But if I believe that God will save my soul and He says, all right, what you need to do, the very next action you should take before you keep drawing breath, you should be baptized. You should be united with Christ in a death like His so that you could be united with Him in a life like His. Why is it that we're not told here Paul and Silas preached baptism to the jailer? They did. That's part of being saved. That's part of bringing people to belief. That's part of teaching them what it means to be a child of God. So in that verse in John chapter 3 and verse 16 where it's talking about uh, about believing God so loved the world He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him before that Jesus is already covered with Nicodemus earlier in that chapter that you must be born from above. That you must be born again. you got to be different. Paul and Silas' baptisms didn't save anybody but Paul and Silas. But their faith, the light that they were showing and their confidence in their salvation is what saved that jailer. Your baptism is not going to save anybody but you. The strength of your belief the strength of your faith, the amount of light that can be seen in you, now that can save someone. That ability to show God in your own life, that can save someone. That can bring them to be a child of God. So how are you doing showing your belief, your faith, the confidence that you have for salvation? The light reveals God's requirement for a right relationship with Him. And the baptism is absolutely required for that relationship. And so the jailer and his family or his household are saved. So now Paul and Silas get to escape. Right? Why was the jailer about to commit suicide? Because if anybody escapes, he... Right? So even though they're Christians now, or he's a Christian now, should they still escape? What still happens to the jailer? That's not a great outcome. So where do Paul and Silas stay? First of all, he treats them like brethren and not like criminals. He treats them with honor and respect. He brought them up into his house and set food before them. So many times food is, is, uh, shows fellowship, it shows camaraderie, it shows equality. So many times when you're sharing a feast with someone, it means we, we're cool. We're down like four flat tires. That's what's being shown here. There's a difference in the relationship, but they're still in jail. Keep reading down through the story, the magistrates call, and there's this whole big thing about you're going to come and apologize to us for a wrongful arrest, and they wind up having to do that. They don't actually go anywhere. But they're treated with the love of God. What about the other prisoners? Paul and Silas aren't the only ones there. There's other prisoners who are in jail who are not in the inner prison who heard them singing. There are other people here and all of the chains were loosed. All of the bonds were unfastened. Verse 26. And all of them are still there. Verse 27. uh, 28 rather. Why didn't they get free? The miracle was not delivering those who are physically bound. The miracle was God delivering the one who is spiritually bound. One more time. The miracle was not about delivering the people who were physically bound. It was about saving that soul that was spiritually bound. So what happens here? Many are called, but few are chosen. We're not told if any of the other people who were there, any of the other prisoners were saved. We're not told if they even got to hear more of the story. We're only told about the jailer. But we do know that all of the other prisoners stayed in prison. Miracles point to messages. 
They don't do things specifically on their own. They point to a greater message. They point to the beaten offering healing to those who delivered their stripes. It points to the light being visible only to those who are in darkness and them only being able to offer clear vision to those who think that they have the light. This miracle points to the imprisoned men who were actually free, bringing freedom to their captor. What does that mean? There is another group of people who are captured and one of them's heart gets changed and another one's kind of they don't. And I think it bears some importance that we look at that for just a moment. In Luke chapter 23, as Jesus hangs on the cross, in verse 39 we read, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at Him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What does he say? He says, I know who you are. You're Jesus. And you're going to be a king. It doesn't go into the, a full confession of I believe Jesus is the Son of God who died to save my sins. Jesus hasn't even died yet. But the confession that He makes here is just as powerful because it receives just the same result. Jesus says, truly I say to you, today you will be with Me in paradise. So the result winds up being the same. We could draw the conclusion then that the confession he makes here is is adequate enough to affect that because it does. The jailer says, there's something about salvation you can tell me. And it's his belief that saves him. I wonder in speaking the Word of the Lord if what it was exactly that was preached. I, I, I've listened back to all my, well, almost all of my sermons, and I listen to almost all of it, and I never listen to it as slow as I actually talk. And find places for improvement. And I find places where I say, Jerry, really, let me down here. I needed a name in. I wonder what Paul and Silas preached. Go to turn with me, Isaiah chapter 61. And tell me if you're a jailer, if you're this jailer, and all of this has happened so far, <coughs> and you've come to realize whatever it was about my life is so much less important. What's so much more important is God. Tell me about God. I wonder if Paul and Silas opened up the scroll and preached from here. Isaiah 61, starting at 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. To grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. And they shall build up the ancient ruins, and they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called priests of the Lord. And they shall speak of you as ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. 
Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion, and they shall have everlasting joy. How many of those things directly sound like something the jailer needed to hear? Liberty to the captives. Freedom. As it was mentioned by one of the commentaries, he would rather commit suicide than to deal with the shame, and that's a lot here of what verses 6 and 7 deal with. Instead of your shame, there will be a double portion. And then I would wonder if the jailer would go, it says, you said there at the beginning, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Of whom is this prophet speaking? Of himself or someone else? It's happened before. Check chapter 8. That's actually the part of the scroll when Jesus begins His ministry. He looks for that part and says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. So when they preach the Lord Jesus to Him, what a powerful piece of of Scripture. Because they shined their light, God was glorified in whatever situation. The gift of salvation is free. And everybody's sitting around in the jail cell. Why didn't they escape? You know, if any of them believed in God, if they received salvation the way that the jailer received salvation that night, then they did escape. Whether it was that they were taken out the next day and hanged on a cross, as was Roman normal practice. Or whether it was that their charges wound up being dropped later on, all who received salvation that night were free. Jerry, thank you. So the question comes to us Will you escape your bondage? The thing that ties you down to this world, that thing that is more important to you than heaven, will you sit in your cell? Because since Jesus gave his blood, Your chains have been dropped. Will you sit in your cell? Or will you experience the freedom that the jailer experienced? So often we turn around and walk right back into prison. And if you need to, again, remember what it means to leave your cell. Make it known. The miracle is not that the earthquake happened and that the doors got open. The miracle is that people found salvation.